you have to be agile in the way you think of your goals, understanding that there's a lot of uncertainty and a lot of unknowns. So all you can do is really express that desire, manifest it to the world, allow your network and people who are around you to connect you to things, possibilities, and options. And then new things will open up and you'll have other decisions to make. And they may be different. You may not end up where you thought you would. Welcome to the Midlife Reinvention Podcast. I'm your host, Kavita, and the founder of Power Purpose Play, a global community of women in midlife. I'm here to tell you that it's your time now to rediscover what has always been inside of you and bring that out into the world. If you're wondering what's next, but don't know quite what that is, or if you feel a twinge in your heart telling you that you have so much more to do and so much more to offer, you're in the right place. Ask yourself, if not now, when? Do you want to leave your job? Start your own business? Take control of your health? Reignite the passion in your marriage? Write that book, or at least that first chapter? Transitions like this can be daunting, but through listening to my story and interviews with incredible women every week, I hope to inspire you to take action. I rediscovered myself after the age of 50, and I know you can too. It's my time now to help you do just that. I'm so excited you're here. Let's dive in. Hi, my friend, and welcome to another episode of the Midlife Reinvention Podcast. I hope your March is starting off beautifully. This episode is especially meaningful for me, as it was two years ago this week that we launched this podcast during the week of International Women's Day. This week, the world celebrates this day with the theme, Digital Innovation and Technology for Gender Equality. I can't believe that we have completed two years, and if I think about it, it has been possible because of technology, where I've had the privilege of connecting with amazing women all around the world. I dedicate this episode to all the strong and beautiful women in my life, and who have supported me in my efforts to spread the message that you can do anything you set your mind to, regardless of your age or circumstances. It really is our time now to shine our brightest light, and the world is recognizing that. Thank you, not only to my guests, but to my wonderful listeners who support me and my mission. You can support me even more by sharing this podcast, telling even one friend about it, if you feel they may need some inspiration to figure out what's next in their lives, please do share. It would mean the world to me. I'm excited that my podcast and business is also transforming to meet the needs of my audience with a focus on It's My Time Now. Everything, my coaching, my podcast, my workshops and talks are all centered around this theme. It's my time now to figure out who I am, what I really want, and how to get there. It's not being selfish. It's about rediscovering yourself so you can bring out your greatest gifts to the world. The world needs you, my friend. My door is open to receive you. If you are unsure, for example, of what's next for you, perhaps in your career or other aspects of your life, and even don't know even know where to begin, I can help. I am offering a complimentary 45-minute initial coaching consultation to help you figure it out. So don't hesitate on your dreams. Reach out to me today. And it's remember, you just have to think about it, that it's it's your time now. And if not now, when? So reach out to me today at kavita at powerpurposeplay.ca and let's have a chat. Happy International Women's Day and enjoy this next wonderfully inspiring episode on how we can navigate adversity in our lives with the amazing Shireen Bensvi Miller. I'll see you at the end with the key takeaways. Welcome everyone to this week's podcast episode. I'm your host, Kavita Ahuja, and my goal with this podcast is to inspire you to realize your true inner power and potential and to live this next stage of your life to the fullest. If you may be going through transitions in your career or life and wondering what's next, I'm here to tell you that you can do this 
And I want you to believe and say with confidence, it's my time now. To this end, I interview incredible women for this podcast who share their stories of reinvention and who will give you their advice on how to overcome the obstacles in your way to reach your vision for yourself in your next stage of life. Today, I am particularly honored to have on the show Shireen Bensvi Miller. Shireen has a Bachelor of Arts in Sociology from McGill University, a Master's of Arts in Criminology from the University of Pennsylvania, and her Juris Doctor from Osgoode Hall Law School. She is the mother of two incredible women, a longstanding advocate for human rights, diversity and inclusion, and she's a really good baker. <laughs> A human rights lawyer by training, Shireen is a senior public servant with a strong record of leadership in delivering timely, innovative, and effective business and process transformation in the government of Canada over the past 20 years. She has expertise in shaping strategic policy, conceptualizing, guiding, and directing key programs, and overseeing operations in both service delivery and regulatory bodies. She is highly experienced in process and organizational change, human-centered digital transformation, executive team management, and strategic partnership building. Wow. Thank you so much for being on the show today, Shireen, and just a pleasure to have you here. How are you doing? My pleasure to be here. I'm great. It stopped snowing and the sun's come out. Yes. It's been a very, (laughs) we're both in Toronto, so it's been a very mild. uh, No, I'm in Ottawa. I'm in Ottawa. Ottawa. Sorry, you're in Ontario. Right. I forgot. Sorry. Yeah. It's been pretty mild uh, winter. Yes. Yes. Yes, I'm not sure that's good. I'm not sure that's good, but it's still a beautiful day. (laughs) So thank you so much for for being here. And I I read all your accomplishments, both professionally and personally, and so impressive. And uh, you know, as I just shared, both in your education, as well as your work as a public servant for the government of Canada, and as well as uh, I understand that you have two beautiful daughters. And happy birthday to one of them today, I believe, is her birthday. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I'm always really, one of the reasons I started this podcast is I'm always really fascinated by women's stories. And in particular, how did you get from one where you are today. How did you get there and here? And I understand that you had some setbacks and not only, well, not setbacks, but in your life, you took perhaps a decade away from the workplace to raise your children. And you were also let go unexpectedly from the previous role. So if I, if you could just get to share a little bit about your story and how these experiences kind of shaped who you are today. Sure. I think that it's funny to talk about reinvention as something you do at one point in your life. You actually, I think, are doing it all the time. I mean, just the introduction that you gave of me, my expertise in criminology and corrections and criminal justice, and as as a criminal defense lawyer, pivoting to being a public servant, getting into transformation, service delivery, user centric design, all of those things. It's really about growth. And I think so reinvention is really about growing. It's really about taking paths that you didn't even know you could take. So one of the things about education is we're so focused on specialization that you, I mean, at six years old, I knew I was going to be a criminal defense lawyer. In fact, when I watched Marie Heinen on on, uh, on TV, on TV at one point, I thought, wow, that would have been me, right? Like that was where I was going because that was an attractive path to me. But partly it's an attractive path because you don't know all the other possibilities, all the other things that your talent or your imagination can take you to. So we always operate with with a deficit of information. We always have only a little slice of the full information that we need to make decisions. And so if I think about my life experiences, a lot of things that have happened to me, if you had asked me the year before or five years before they happened, would I ever do that? I would have said, absolutely not. Mm -hmm. So my colleagues, when I was pregnant with my first child, with my daughter, Elise, my colleagues had a betting pool that I wouldn't last the 17 weeks of paid maternity leave at home because I was such an energizer bunny and such a driven kind of person and so enthusiastic and excited about my work that they figured I couldn't sit still at home with a baby for 18 weeks or 17 weeks or whatever it was. So they actually had a bedding pool. To their surprise, but really to my amazement, I stayed home for seven years. 
because I had no idea, even when I was pregnant, how interesting I would find my daughter and how much I would love that process of learning with her and and being with her. And then I had a second daughter two and a half years later. And just being at home with them was honestly probably the hardest work you'll ever do, but the most fun you'll ever have, right? (laughs) I agree. Um, I agree. (laughs) it 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 was just the most fun I had ever had. So to my amazement, I was at home for seven years. And one of the things I did when I was going back into the workplace was I took all the dates off of my CV. I just stripped out all the dates. Hmm. And I did that for a number of reasons, but the main reason was gender bias. I just thought if I hand my CV with a seven-year gap to somebody, they will focus on the seven-year gap. They will say, well, what did you do between 1990 and 1997? Like, what, what is that? Mm-hmm. Right? And I didn't want, first of all, I thought it's really nobody's business. If they want to hire me, they should hire me for my talent, for my experience, for my knowledge. And if I decided to take seven years to be a mom full time, that's not really something I want to discuss in the workplace beyond talking about how great it is. I certainly didn't want it to be something that disabled me or made me less of an attractive candidate. So I just literally stripped out dates, which Hmm. left me with a CV of accomplishments, right? So then when you go back into the workplace, you're actually talking about what you've done and your experiences, because really when you did it or what year it was, doesn't really matter unless you were a Y2K engineer and you better not have been doing it in 2005, right? That's the only time it really matters. Can I just point out though, though, it's, it's unfortunate you had to do that. Like it's unfortunate we have to do that. Why do we have to do that? Right? It's interesting. I spend a lot of my professional career fighting the standard reflexes that people have to things. That was my journey as the human rights advocate in federal corrections, as an advocate for federally sentenced offenders. That's my journey. Even now doing a big digital transformation, I'm often questioning people's assumptions and the status quo. And I think people are doing that more and more now with the Me Too movement and the Black Lives Matter movement and people starting to understand the impact of taking too much for granted. And so one of the things that I say to my mentees, and when I'm talking about this area, I always say, make a list of the things that you that you want changed, and then divide that list into the things that you actually want to fight to change and the ones that you're happy to leave to someone else to, to make the case for it. Because mm-hmm. so for me, the fact of gender bias is real. And It's mainly women who take large gaps in their career. And if I had a dollar for every time somebody said to me, oh, you've been at home for seven years? Really? Hmm. What's that going to do to your career? Really? If I had a dollar for that, I wouldn't have had to go back to work ever. Right? Every time somebody said that, because people are like, oh, honey, that's just, right? And I thought, that's not a conversation I'm prepared to have with people. I'm just right, not right, I'm just not right. interested in it. It's not my battle. I'm not going to fight that one. I'm right. just going to accept there's a bias here. What can I do to correct it? You'll find a lot of my answers are very focused on unpacking a problem and yeah. focusing on the part that I can control or the part that I can actually have an impact on. That's mm-hmm. kind of my MO. It may be the answer to all of your questions. <laughs> questions. <laughs> but uh, yeah, okay. Yeah. Nice. Nice. So that was a, and and then the other part about when you had been let go, I think there was, how did that affect? So that's interesting. So I, I'm already a very, I had been a senior public sector leader for a long yeah. time, a senior executive. I was a vice president, got a new president. And then one day I was called into the office and today was your last day. But the impact on me as an individual is the same, right? In terms of ego, in terms of the risk to my reputation, in terms of feeling like something had failed, what did I not do? All of those things. Mm -hmm. What's interesting though is, and I told you, I like to unpack a problem and focus in on what I can control, even as it was happening. And I think this was amazing to the person who was letting me go because they said this wasn't the conversation I expected we would have. Even as they said that to me, I took a moment and I said, okay, all right. Let's talk about what has been delivered because my team had really delivered amazing results just that week Mm -hmm. before. This was the end of a fiscal year. So the week before we had just done really better results than had been achieved in 30 years for that organization by a long Mm -hmm. shot. And I said, okay, okay, I hear you, but let's take a pause for a moment and let's talk about my team 
and how you could keep the momentum going, because I'd like the opportunity to weigh in, to give you my advice. You can take it or leave it, obviously. But I'd like to, I'd like us to take a pause and talk about the strengths of the team and what I've seen, because really I was the one managing the team. And first of all, I think that, that it was appreciated that I gave the advice. I see now in hindsight, because of course I'm still connected to, that's one of the other themes you'll probably see in my life is that I have I put a lot of importance on on my on people mm-hmm. and my my friends and my networks and I mean I'm still having lunch sort of the first Friday of every month at our favorite Asian restaurant with my management team from that worked together from 2008 to to 2013. We still that's you know great. so so yeah. that's super important to me. So my people were really important and the momentum that mm-hmm. we had accomplished was really important to me. So I really focused my attention on that for an hour with this person. And then I said, thanks, I'll go now and left. So that ability to immediately just parse out what matters and what doesn't, you know, yes, mm-hmm. my feelings were hurt. Yes, I was confused. Yes, I didn't understand really what had happened because it didn't make sense to me. But that's one of the things you realize, the fact that it doesn't make sense to you doesn't really matter. Right, Like, right. Like I... I very quickly stopped trying to figure out what had happened and went directly to, okay, what lessons can I learn from this? And what do I need to do next? And what matters to me? Because one of the things that I realized, actually two things that I realized right away was number one, I did not want that person to in any way define the rest of my career. Mm -hmm. I didn't want this to be, it might be a life defining moment, but I didn't want it to be the death knell of my career, or I didn't Mm -hmm. want that person to own my future. So that was something very clear to me. And that person's opinion of me to own my future. The second thing was that I was going to have to navigate that sense of isolation that you have when you have failed at something, or when you feel less than. Mm -hmm. And it's never a comfortable feeling to feel less than. Mm -hmm. especially because reputation is built in steps and it just rides out on horseback. So you want to be able to say, can I take out an ad in the front on the front page of the newspaper saying I'm still a good person. I have lots, (laughs) I have lots more things on the ledger in my accomplishments column than I have in my failures column. Yes. Or you want to say Michael Jordan didn't sink every shot either. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Yeah. No, thank you for sharing that. Because the reason I, I really was interested in that, because a lot of the women who are listening to this podcast, they may have gone through transition in their work or they've been let go or they're thinking it, they're they're not happy with their work anymore. And I love what you said about that reinvention happens all the time and that your perspective on this happened to me, but what lessons have I learned and what do I really want from that? So I think that's important to have that perspective instead of just like, and then another thing is you don't want that person to define the rest of your career and we, we need to define our own path moving forward. So thank but you. But you also have that. to realize, you also have to realize that you don't know what you want because you don't know right. what's out there, right? You you don't know what's out there. You were focused on something and you thought that was your path. You thought, yeah, this is what I am doing. And we often define ourselves and our have our sense of self-worth very tied to what we're delivering. Mm-hmm. I think women do that a lot to what we're, what we've been made responsible for, even if it's yeah. kids, right? I mean, yeah, it's yeah. funny. It always strikes me as odd when people, I'll talk about an accomplishment of one of my children and somebody will say, you must be very proud as if I did it, right? No, no, I couldn't even do that. I could not do that. I'm very <laughs> odd. I'm very <laughs> odd. I'm very amazed, impressed, filled with love, filled with, with delight for them in their success. Yeah. But I wouldn't really say that it's a sense of personal pride. It's not like I did it, right? right. Yeah. Good perspective. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. <laughs> Never thought of it that way. That's <laughs> good. So thank you for sharing that. And I just wanted to, you had mentioned uh, in, in one of your pieces, you wrote a really great piece uh, talking about navigating adversity. And then you say in this piece that adversity is relative and it happens to us all and wreaks ha- havoc with each of our lives. In that piece, you also talk about lived experiences and how they can be a great teacher. And I wonder if you could share with our listeners your lived experiences with diversity, especially in your personal life. And I know that you have a story about how that relates to your eldest daughter as well. Mm -hmm. Yes. So let me just take a moment and say what I mean by adversity is relative. 
I was a decision maker for refugee protection cases, people making refugee claims in Canada. And I can tell you from that experience that nothing I have ever experienced in my life comes anywhere near the wrenching disruption and fear and terror that that many people experience across the globe. Okay. So Mm -hmm. understanding even that as I speak, I come from a position of white privilege. I come from a position of I'm a third generation Canadian, so well-established family, well-established roots, a sense of place in the world, the privilege of having gone, as you mentioned, to really elite universities and I have higher education and really had no limit on the amount of higher education I could have gotten. I could have decided after doing my law degree that I want to do a PhD and that was open to me. And not only was it open to me, but the universities offered to pay me to do it. So I come from a position of adversity is not of the level or type that other people might experience. And I recognize that and I am Mm -hmm. grateful for that. Be that as it may, when you have a child who is diagnosed with a chronic lifelong severe illness, again, not life-threatening illness, except in the sense that mental health illnesses can often disproportionately result in suicide and other Mm life-ending consequences. But the point is when that happens, it wrenches your life apart. You just feel like you have been hit by a large object and it really throws your throws you off balance. So that's what I mean by it happens to all of us. Things happen, bad things yeah. happen. You know, diagnoses, accidents, things happen, uh, firings. And it really is wrenching in our mm-hmm. own lives and in our personal world and, and for our families, you know, the people who love you. Mm-hmm. So, so I, I really do think that it's a common human condition, Mm -hmm. regardless of the degree. Lived experience, however, knowing that other people have been through through it, seeing how people have come out on the other side or what they did to come out on the other side or how they didn't come out on the other side Mm -hmm. and, and exploring their journey will help you find common ideas and, and hope really. Mm -hmm as you go through this. In fact, after being let go from my job, I decided that because I didn't want this person to define my future, that I would in no way allow the sense of, I guess the best word is humiliation, the sense of humiliation interfere with my ability to talk about this happening Mm -hmm. and, and asking for other people for advice and help. Okay. So I immediately became very active in pursuing that and saying, you know, I'm really interested if you know anybody who this has happened to, how they how they navigated it. The result of that was I was put in touch with, you know, through I told two friends, they told two friends, they told two friends. I was put in touch with a network of people to whom this had happened. I brought them all together. We are now a formal peer support group for a, elite executives in the federal public service. When when your career gets you know, sort of pinballed, as I say, like the pinball hits the bumper and goes the wrong Mm -hmm. way. You can talk to other people about their journeys and what happened to them and how they dealt with it and what they did, what choices they made and what choices might be open to you. So that's one thing. When adversity hits, you have to understand it's disruptive. It's very disorienting. It throws you off balance. But chances are somebody has been through something like this. And if you listen to them, they're ahead of you in the race. Mm -hmm. If you listen to where they've gone or you can decide, oh, I don't want to go there. No, 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 I'm not doing that. Or you can decide, like I met with somebody who said, well, I decided to leave the public service, take an interchange and do teaching full time at the university, which was an option. I I mean, I met with the deans of the law school and the deans of the school of law at uh, Carlton. I met with them that that could have been an option for me. But, you know, I explored it with somebody who chose that and thought, I'm not ready for that lifestyle change right now. I'm still interested in leading teams, but it allowed me to see a possibility that I hadn't necessarily thought of and talk to somebody about what, what does that look like? You know, how does it feel in French? We say, you know, like, like, what is it? What are the details of it? So Mm -hmm. that you can ask yourself, is that something that I find appealing? Is that something I'd like to pursue? Mm -hmm. And even, even being able to rule things out as options is a positive thing. One of the biggest causes of anxiety 
at any turning point in life and in any transition, as I said, change management and transitions are things that I really explore a lot because I'm super interested in it. But the single most important feature that you have to recognize is the concept of uncertainty. Mm -hmm. Uncertainty, by definition, creates anxiety. It is an engine for, it is a prime engine of anxiety. So the uncertain outcome, will I be able to find another job? I don't know. Maybe my reputation's really gone, right? Maybe I'll never be able to work in the public sector again. Or Mm -hmm. maybe I can't even work in the private sector. Maybe this is, maybe this is the end of my career as you know it. Maybe I'm looking at the not-for-profit sector, or maybe I'm looking at volunteer work. Like, I don't even know, right? Mm -hmm, So mm -hmm. uncertainty can really occupy a lot of your mindset. I like to talk about my lived experience because I'm hoping to get people out of that endless loop, that sort of, I call it Mm -hmm. the blue circle of death, like from the screen, you know, it just keeps going and going and going. (laughs) Uncertainty, and you're just talking to yourself, with yes. no new input of information is just literally like the blue circle of death. It right, just goes right, on right. and on. Right. So, but if you start hearing other people's stories and other people's experiences, you can at least say, well, that's not my experience, but funny that they did that. Why did they do that? Or you can say, wow, that sounds interesting. Maybe mm-hmm. I could do that too. Right. And I, this was really brought home to me because Elise, my older daughter, who has a number of TED Talks online and stuff, she at the age of 12 developed a very high fever. She, ultimately suffered from something called pediatric autoimmune neurological disorder as a result of strep, probably. Oh, the def- in those days, the testing wasn't great and and we never really got a firm diagnosis, but all the indicators are that it was that. It left her with severe treatment resistant obsessive compulsive disorder, but it took a long time mm-hmm. to get that diagnosis. So we didn't know what was happening. We just knew she became overnight, really completely dysfunctional. Oh boy. And I mean, dysfunctional, like couldn't brush her teeth, like just literally dysfunctional. Mm -hmm. So she Mm -hmm. was a perfectly healthy 12 year old one day. And then she was an anxiety kid who couldn't really couldn't get from point A to point B. I sort of figured, figured out she was having a problem when one day we got back from the cottage and I went into automatic unpacking mode, unpacking the food, unpacking the data. I'm running up and down the stairs. And about an hour in, I realized Elise is still standing at the bottom of the stairs. And I said, Elise, why are you standing at the bottom of the stairs? And she said, I'm stuck. Oh and goodness. and so we started to realize that there was something very serious happening. Yes. Uh, eventually she got diagnosed with severe treatment resistant obsessive compulsive disorder. Mm-hmm. And we started to unpack what that meant and what that meant for her. And she was in grade seven at the time. But even before she got the diagnosis, it's really interesting what happens when you talk about your lived experience. So this happened in December at Christmas, and she went back into grade seven. And grade seven is the year in Ottawa where the school board changes life for kids, where they go from instead of being in one homeroom and classroom and all the teachers come to you, that's yeah. the year where the kids have a locker and they're expected to go to the classrooms of the various subject teachers, right? Yes. But Elise couldn't make it to class. And I was getting notes, missed class, absentee, getting calls from the school. Finally, I said to Elise, Elise, what's going on? And she said, well, you know, mom, I start at my locker and I start walking to class. And then if my foot touches one of the lines on the little squares of linoleum, I have to go back to my locker. And that's what's happening. And I'm doing it like all day, every day. Like that's all I can do is just keep going back to my locker. So after six weeks of this, it was heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. After six weeks of this, She said, maybe you could go and talk to my classmates because they're getting very fed up with me and they're getting angry with me now and it's not going well. So I I don't know what possessed me to say, okay, Mark and I, my husband and I went in to the classroom and I thought, hmm, this is not an ideal scenario. You're going in to talk to 12 and 13 year olds about the fact that your kid might be having some sort of mental breakdown. I didn't know what it was and it was just these weird symptoms and we didn't know anyway, but we started to tell them what her challenges were, what some of the symptoms were. They asked some questions and we left. The next day goes by, at least goes to school, comes back, two days go by. On the third day, like I'm dying to know what, what happened, you know, how did they mm-hmm. respond to this? And I said, you know, Elise, how's it going? And she said, oh, mom, it's going much, much better. I said, really? What's going better? She said, oh, I'm getting to class now. I said, that's great. How are you getting to class? She said, oh, my classmates got organized and they carry me between classes so my feet don't have to touch the floor. Oh, my God. 
So one of the things she learned, <laughs> one of the things she learned through oh. that experience is if you share your lived experience, yeah, people people will step up. And also now, some, your vulnerability, right? Exactly that, right. Well, yeah. that's the risk, right? That's why people don't share their lived experience because it makes them vulnerable. Right. But if you if you don't share it, then nobody can help. Mm-hmm. No one even knows what's going on. All they can do is get angry because they see all this weird behavior mm-hmm. and and they can't they can't respond. But if you're prepared to own it and and talk about it, yeah. then you'd be amazed who comes yeah. to who comes yeah. to to relate. What a beautiful story. Wow. That must have made you feel so incredibly proud of her. Right. And or, <laughs> well, well, so we talked about that. Yeah. I mean, I'm proud of the whole situation and the fact that she was her vulnerability and being sharing her experience allowed I would that describe, to happen. I would describe my emotion more as humbled Not by proud, the yeah, fact yeah. that yes. she was so brave. <laughs> no, it was really yes. more like humbled by her bravery because I yes. thought to allow your story to be put out there in such graphic terms to explain to them that literally she couldn't walk up the stairs by herself. She was having a hard time brushing her teeth. She couldn't like literally talking about her vulnerable experience Mm -hmm. is a risk, right? I mean, there is bullying. There is what's interesting with respect to bullying because middle school is a prime ripe ground for bullying. And she was a definitely easy, vulnerable target was she also describes an experience where a young woman in her class, we can call her, we can call her, Meg, was not somebody who was particularly close to Elise, and she wasn't really in in, in Elise's close circle. Mm-hmm. But one day, Elise was doing something very weird in the hallway about the tiles and the whatever, and was very focused on her rituals, and might have been mumbling or whatever she was doing. And through the corner of her eyes, she saw some grade eight boys. Remember, she's in grade seven, and she was a small, yes. she was a small grade seven born in October, so youngest in the class, she saw some grade eight boys coming down the hall and she could hear them sort of talking about her. Mm -hmm. And so she was bracing herself for some nastiness. And suddenly this young woman steps in front of her between her and these boys and says, you got a problem with her. You're going to be having a problem with me. The boys parted like the Red Sea around her. And that was the end of that. Wow. So people step up in unusual ways. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. That's so great. And the other thing is that in, in in the same piece, you had said that being open about your journey will allow the right people to appear in your life at the right time. Just like this girl in the hallway, right? Like that and, girl, like the cohort yes, like of the, people who helped yes. me, who helped me through their lived experience when, yes. when I was going through that. Yes, exactly. Because also what will happen is the people who love you, the people who know you, they know tons of people. And mm-hmm. it will almost always happen. I get lots of calls like this from a friend of mine saying, by the way, my husband's colleague's wife is worried because they see symptoms of OCD in their kid, whatever. I'm just mm-hmm. wondering, could they call you? Like three three levels removed from my circle, somebody mm-hmm. will call me, right? Or connect with me. And I might have resources that they might need, or just my story might help them, or I mm-hmm. might be able to give them ideas. I'm not giving them any psych psychiatric advice or like, I'm not overstepping anything. I'm just saying, here's what I did. Mm -hmm. Here's what Elise did. Here's how it happened. And it might give you ideas, right? Or I might know a doctor that we used that was particularly good or a resource or an 800 number. Right. Right. You didn't know about. It's kind of like the networking and, and that I think, I believe that has led you and your daughter to be advocates for, for mental wellness. And can you tell me now what happened? So what, since then, what, what has transpired. So Elise, Elise spent many months really of her life in hospitals during, during middle school and high school. Mm -hmm. I can get back to one of them, which was an extraordinary circumstance, but many months in hospital. I mean, the first time she went into hospital, it was for a three day assessment and she ended up staying in Chio for three weeks and then being transferred to the Royal Ottawa hospital for three months. So Mm -hmm. we thought it was three days and it ended up being close to four months. That was in grade seven. She had other hospitalizations and actually never finished high school. One of the hospitals that she went to was in Boston, and it's part of the Harvard Teaching Hospital. So Elise always likes to say that she may not have finished high school, but she went to Harvard. (laughs) But yeah, so she didn't finish high school. And her journey, like I told you, when I was six, I wanted to be a, a criminal defense lawyer. When she was younger than that, she always said, actually, even at three, at three, 
I asked her if she wanted to pick a Barbie. We're standing in Toys R Us. She walks down the the aisle because there's a huge number of Barbies to choose from. She walks down the aisle. She walks back. She says, I want that one. And at that moment, I was so amazed by my daughter. She's three years old. She's seen a thousand Barbies on the thing. She looks at them very carefully. And the one she picks is the African-American doctor Barbie. She knew she wanted to be a pediatrician when she was like just barely able to to articulate yeah. what the future wow. looked like. So, so Elise is actually now a senior resident in pediatrics now wow. as we speak. That's so, just gave uh, me the chills, honestly. That's amazing. It's a, <laughs> it's a, it's a long journey. It's a long yeah. journey from being in a children's hospital to being Fantastic. a physician in a children's hospital. Congratulations. Um, That's amazing. But Thanks. But there's a lot of people who gave her support through this. And because partly she she's somebody who has spoken to thousands of people. She did a, a lot, a lot of public speaking in high school, sort of 500 kids at a time in an auditorium through the Canadian Mental Health Association and other networks in Canada and in the U.S. She's done trainings for peace officers and even healthcare, healthcare workers and teachers and, and educators. She's done a lot, a lot of, of advocacy. And so what we realized was the piece that I could do through advocacy was I'm the founder of of something known as the Canadian Innovation Center for Mental Health in the Workplace as mm-hmm. part of the federal government. The part that I filled in was, okay, so this happens very frequently in families, that there's somebody with either an addiction or a mental health issue, whether it's your children, your parents, your your siblings, your uncle and aunt, whatever, close circle. In fact, when I speak to an audience and I say, could everybody put up their hand, please, who does not have somebody with an anxiety disorder, an addiction, a mental health problems, one of, something in this cat family of problems in their immediate circle of friends and family, please put up your hands. If I have an audience of 600 people in front of me, if two people put up their hands, that's the most I've ever seen, ever. Really? Wow. Ever, wow. ever. Because it is so, so pervasive. So, pervasive, so yeah. once once I sort of realized that, I realized there there is a need for somebody like me, who's a leader in, I mean, the the federal public service is the largest employer in Canada, and I'm among one of the most senior, mm-hmm. sort of the rank of vice president, assistant deputy minister, or senior assistant deputy minister. If I can talk about it, then it gives people license to also talk about it, to actually get get help, to maybe create spaces for this conversation in the workplace. Sure. But also to realize that it may not be you who has the actual illness, but you are as impacted by it. Like the fact mm-hmm. that Elise was the one with the illness is a tremendous barrier in her life. Mm-hmm. But the disruption in her sister's life, in my life, in my husband's life, like in, in our lives as a family was mm-hmm. enormous, mm-hmm. enormous. Yeah. So that that also requires a conversation. Right, right. Hi, my friend, Kavita here. Do you often feel blocked from moving forward? We all feel that way at times. These are referred to as energy blocks. I've created a short, actionable PDF guide to help you release your negative energy blocks. Click the link in the description to download it now for free. Now, let's get back to the episode. Well, I mean, what a great, great story. I mean, talk about adversity and turning the adversity into <laughs> something positive for not only yourself, but for society. So, I mean, congratulations. That's Thank I, you. But one of the things I would say is how I said, if I had a dollar for every time somebody said, oh, you took seven years off, oh, your career's really, huh. if I had a dollar for every time somebody said to me, don't you think that talking about this so much just really kind of labels you and or your children as people who have problems. Really? So, really people true. Say- if I had if I had a dollar for each one of those, it would have been, yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh my God. Oh wow. But you, so, because remember, we're very quick to refer to people by short forms. Oh, mm-hmm. that's the person who did X, or that's the person this happened to, or so I was actually asked, and, and I really appreciated the question because I had to really think about it. Did I think that allowing Elise, okay, so allowing Elise as a parent to to do this public speaking about her journey, did I think that it was going to prejudice her future? 
right? Would she be known as mm-hmm. the person with OCD? Labeled like that, yeah. Labeled. Which gets back to one of the first questions you asked me, which is which battles do you fight, right? Like like taking my the dates off my CV was a way of not having to fight the gender bias battle about my career and my seven years off. It was just a way of avoiding it completely, right? So that was yeah. my solution for that. So this one's an interesting one. You can't avoid particularly when everything's out on the internet. I mean, Elisa's speaking engagements are literally viewed by millions. I mean, yeah. so it's out there. It's all out there. So there's no, there's no just taking the label off. So we had to talk about with her, how do you feel about this being the way you get defined in the future? And it does require a personal choice. You have to mm-hmm. think about mm-hmm. whether you're okay with your journey being mm-hmm. part of how you're defined. The way that I look at it, and I think the way that she has navigated it, is that she's a person who is very authentic Mm -hmm. all the time. She's never, she never has any pretense of being something she's not. Mm -hmm. And I, I really admire that because we're very complex beings. Humans have lots of experiences, good ones, bad ones. And, and we can't be just pigeonholed into one defining characteristic. And that gets back to the same thing that I didn't want someone who didn't like me to define my future choices. And sure. so so I made a conscious decision just not to talk about anything but the things that I took away from being from being let go, yeah. which was a need to communicate better, a need to listen more. I have a very strong personality and I need to be aware of that and how it impacts others, right? Right, right. Because you can say, well, this person's just an outlier. They didn't like you. Okay, but I own part of being liked, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Now, I don't want to become something I'm not, but I want to make sure that what I'm projecting is what I intended to project. And I intend to project respectful, collaborative, innovative, fun. That's what I think I'm projecting. Yeah. The story that you told me, just told, shared about your daughter and and your story. A lot of these things, when adversity happens and your lived experience with adversity, a lot of people would feel like I'm going to give up now. And I just, (laughs) they just, they don't rise to the challenge. Like I guess you, you and both your, your daughter, and I'm sure your the people, you know, have, and I guess that my, that is my question. And I ask this question to many of my guests is how do you do that? How do you advise people, women listening to this podcast or just in general, like if you have a challenge in front of you, such such big challenges or adversity that you're facing, how do you even begin to overcome Okay, so things? two things I would say to that. One, if your option is curling up under the bed in the fetal position, it's just not that attra- it's just not that sustainable an option, right? So giving up, as you put it, or just curling up and and I don't know, stopping in your tracks mm-hmm. is mm-hmm. kind of not a real option. You have to, you have to kind of be realistic. Like what's the real option here? You can't slide under a rock, right? Right. So, so what does this actually mean to, to give up? And then how do you not give up? Well, the way you not give up is you take small steps like, like Elise. Okay. It's funny because one of the child and youth workers in one of the hospital stays was asking the youth in the unit when Elise was hospitalized, what do you want to do when you get out of here when you grow up. And Elise said, oh, I really want to be a pediatrician. And this person looked at her and said, honey, you should come up with something more realistic as an answer, right? Because because she was sitting in a hospital psychiatric, locked psychiatric ward at the time, right? Dealing with anxiety that was so bad that she literally couldn't get herself up the stairs, right? So, mm-hmm, so this person mm-hmm. looked at her and said, in my eyes, you're defined by this, right? So you do have to ask yourself, If where I want to get to is here and I'm right here, what are the things that I could do to start inching towards it, right? Mm -hmm. When Elise unpacked it and she said, well, I haven't finished high school and I want to be a physician, she realized, so the gap will be, I'm going to need the science credits in order to be admitted to a university program. Mm -hmm. So she went to the adult high school and enrolled herself and took the grade 12 science credits that she needed to get into university. And I said to her, well, why don't you also do the last remaining credits just to get the high school diploma, right? And she said, I can get into university as a mature student because I've been out of school the the requisite amount of time now. And I don't really have to have that in order to take this next step. So she had calculated 
what are the steps that she needed to take to get where she wanted to go? So once again, I'd say, unpack the problem, Mm -hmm. right? Don't let the label of it, high school dropout, be your defining characteristic, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There are many ways to get to Rome. There are many roads, right? Mm -hmm, So mm -hmm. you're not going the direct road. You're not going on the road that you thought you were going to take, right? Yeah. Figure out what the other roads are. Figure out how you get there, how you how you do incremental things, small things. It doesn't have to be huge things. Once you make them huge, they become overwhelming. Once yes. you make them huge, they swallow you whole. Yes. There was a guest on my podcast a little while ago, and she does she she's an animator and she makes those videos. And she said that sometimes when you like you can't really see so many steps ahead of you, but when you when you when the the characters they take one step, then the thing opens up. And so that's kind of, it illuminates in front of you, right? So I thought that was a really great analogy because that's so true. And that's what I say to my clients as well is like, you don't need to know the mountaintop. Like you just take the first, the first step up the ladder. So yeah, that's, that's really great. And the other thing. Sorry, go ahead. ahead, No, just that reminded me of uh, of something that happened on Elisa's journey. So We had exhausted all the treatment options, modalities that we had access to in Canada. And and eventually I decided I wanted her to go to this program, which is the Obsessive Compulsive Disorders Institute at the Harvard Teaching Hospital, McLean, which is one of the oldest mental health hospitals in the U.S., that I really wanted her to go there. So when you look at a problem like that, you think, okay, so the first problem is, does she meet the criteria for acceptance? To how do I get her there? What kinds of referrals do you need from what kinds of doctors, whatever? Do they have a program that actually will meet her needs? All those things you have to calculate, you have to look at. I knew that it was 90, that that it would, it's a 90 day program. And I knew also that it would be a thousand dollars a day US for her to be there, right? So I could have said, oh my goodness, we can't afford a hundred thousand dollars US or 150,000 Canadian, forget it. Right. I could have just said, that's a mountain I can't get past. Right. But instead, I did what I do all the time, which is I unpacked the problem. And I thought, let me put the money problem aside. Let's just take that one away. Let's just pretend for a moment that I have the money. Because frankly, if she doesn't get admitted or they don't have a bed or I can't get the the medical referrals for her to get there, then this the money won't matter. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm hmm. So I just did it one step at a time. I got in touch with the hospital. What do you need from me? I then started to get each of those things. Also, I had to get, I had to be clear on whether or not Elise wanted to do it because it's a very difficult, rigorous treatment Mm -hmm. modality. So did she want to do it? Like we had a lot of things to get to before we got to that, to that one. That one could have been and might have been the one that stopped us. In the end, in the end, I, Mark and I actually figured out how we could fund it, okay? So, you know, with mortgages and whatever, how we could fund it if we needed to. And while we did that, I went to OHIP and said, "I we have exhausted everything. Is this something that you could cover, right? And so in the end, she went, yeah. okay? And in the end, it was paid for. And in the end, we made it. But, but that was a mountain. Like yeah. getting to that point, yeah. There were so many elements. The only way I could attack it was incrementally, step by step, each piece. But I had to unpack it because honestly, just deciding that that would be a good program for her because they have 100% success rate was yeah, just an, like a, a huge mountain to climb. Yeah. And I think that's what happens, especially when I have clients who are like thinking, oh, what, what do I want to do now? Or what's what's next in my career or my life? Or they're going through major change. And if they think about the whole big mountain, it, it just right. gets so overwhelming, right? But I like what you said also when we talked earlier about the question and that you think your daughter knew like what she wanted to do. The first question is, is ask yourself, right? What do I really want? And I mean, I think you asked that your question of yourself. And so why is it so important to ask that question? One of the reasons it's important to ask it is because it just gives you a starting place. Yeah. Like, like I knew I wanted to be a criminal defense lawyer. So I took that path and I even articled in criminal defense with two of the best criminal defense lawyers in Canada. In the end, I didn't actually choose that path because mm. other options opened up the option for being involved in legislative reform and policy writing. And so I, when I, once I got to a certain point, other doors started opening and I had different choices to make. Mm-hmm. So 
The point is you don't know the final outcome even when you're asked that question. What do you what do you want to do? Like with Elise, she knew she wanted to be a physician. So she knew she wanted to be in a caring profession. She knew she wanted to be a physician. Over time, she realized she really wanted to be a pediatrician, but it was really only in med school that she realized that what she liked best in that field is intensive care. So mm. she'll be an intensivist, right? But maybe she could have been an eMERGE doc. Maybe she could have been yeah. uh, specialized in something else in pediatrics, pediatric cardiology, pediatric other things. But she couldn't have told you at the front end that she liked intensive being in an intensive mm -hmm. care unit the best. She had to actually get there to actually make those next choices. So you have to be agile in the way you think of your goals, mm -hmm. understanding that there's a lot of uncertainty and a lot of unknowns. So all you can do is really express that desire, manifest it to the world, allow your network and people who are around you to connect you to things, possibilities, and options. Mm -hmm. And then and then new things will open up and you'll have other decisions to make. And mm -hmm. they may be different. You may not end up where you thought where you thought you would. I, I was sure I was going to be a criminal defense lawyer. I am not a criminal defense lawyer. Mm -hmm. I am leading one of the riskiest tra digital transformations the government of Canada has ever done. Wow. But I'm not a criminal defense lawyer. Yeah. And I would add the courage piece. You need the courage, right? To take those steps, to really open, to, to ask that question, to take the steps. Is that? Don't you think courage it? though, partly comes from the reinforcement that if you do this enough times and you see that it works out okay, that the courage is kind of a self-fulfilling cycle of virtue because your, your own success, little small successes give you courage to take mm -hmm. that next step. So yeah. So you don't have to. It's like and the also, momentum bills, right? The momentum bills, and and the you bravery have to, you, have to, you have to push the the boulder forward a little bit, and then right. it'll go to, roll down the hill. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and also, yeah. the bravery of others will inspire you. I mean, Elisa's bravery in the face of this adversity inspires us every day. Mm -hmm. I'm sure it does. Right? She it still does. has she still has severe treatment resistant obsessive compulsive disorder, right? The anxiety is still there, but the way in which she copes with it, the strategies that she has, the way in which she's able to do all these other things, mm -hmm. right? That that Amazing. that inspires yes, when you get yes. to see that close up. Yes, yes. Wonderful, wonderful. So Shireen, you had uh, written 10 lessons <laughs> and how to nav navigate adversity in life. I'm not going to ask you to go all through the 10, but I think we've covered many of them in our we've covered, in conversation. We've covered Probably yeah. a lot of them. Yeah. Is there any that we, maybe we haven't covered that you want to stress or anything that's important to you to share around I that? I think, so there is one, uh, I mean, I could probably name three, but there, that I really would like people to keep in mind, but let's start with one that I think is really the most important. When you ask yourself, what do I really need? We often go to the easiest answer. I need to make sure I have money because you go to your first fear. Mm -hmm. Okay. If you go beneath that one, yes, that may be true. Just say yes and park it. When I did this exercise, okay, so so I, I I get asked to leave. I'm then at home and I'm thinking, what do I really need? And I thought the answer is I need to keep working at things. I need to keep working at things. I need to keep working because I had a lot of uncertainty about whether or not I was going to be able to land a next gig. A few things happened. First of all, I had to unpack all the emotions, right? Because... Mm -hmm. Because some of this, you'll go through all the stages of grieving, and one of them will be anger, but you'll realize if you sit with it long enough that your anger is really grief. Yeah. And when you go into that grief and ask yourself, why am I grieving? You realize, because I'm kind of invested in my own reputation, right? And, and this is humiliating, and I'm not used to, as an adult, that humiliation. So once you go through this whole process, and like I said, I am not a psychologist. I am literally just talking to you about me. Okay, so let's not be confused here. When I started unpacking that, I realized I really only need two things to be happy in my work. And the first is I need to do work of value. So things that I think are important, contributing. Mm -hmm. And two, I need to be personally valued. Okay, that's all mm -hmm. I need to be happy. Mm -hmm. you give me those mm -hmm. two things, I can move mountains. Nice. So, so when I was going for my next job and I went to see a deputy minister to tell him that I wanted actually the job that I have now. And he says, oh my God, why do you want this project? Because this project is a very risky project and a very visible project. It's the project looking at how we might 
find a new pay system and new HR systems for the government of Canada. And and it's in the it's basically in the shadow of a large, a large debacle that was very public. So why would why would anybody want that job? Why do you want that job? And I said, because I think it's one of the most important transformations we'll ever do. So it, it meets my criteria for work of value. Mm-hmm. I said, but the second thing is I don't actually want you to hire me until you've done your due diligence to know what you're getting when you hire me, because I'm not everybody's cup of tea. I'm very, very vocal. I'm very determined. I'm not stubborn, but I am an advocate. So so I will make my argument and, and I'll listen to the arguments, but but they have to be made to me. So before you hire me, you need to make sure that you really want me because I will insist on being valued. Like I will insist that mm-hmm. you not treat me like a generic VP kind of person, but right. that that the assets that I bring be the assets that you want. Like we have to have alignment on that. And he looked at me remembering this, like the first time I've met this person. And he said, wow, I've never, no one's ever answered me like that. Like no one. I said, please call everybody, including the person that didn't like me, right? Call everybody who I've worked with and that, you know, and who knows me and just call them all. Okay. And get a clear picture on what I bring. Mm -hmm. That includes the things I'm not good at. Yeah. Yeah. But I just want you to know who I am because mm-hmm. I want you to see me. Yeah. I need that. Nice. So the first thing is I'd say, figure out what you really need and do the unpacking all the way down to that level of granularity. What do you need to succeed? Mm-hmm. Okay, so that would be like one. The second is, who do you know? Yeah. Who do you know? Who can you reach out to? Who do you not know, but would like to know and can reach out to, right? And just go do, yeah. just start, start somewhere, start with someone. It amazes me how people don't reach in, out to people that they know and or their, or their networks or their, it's just, it's. Because they're really, embarrassed. Yeah. Right. They're embarrassed yeah. and they, yeah. and they, they have a sense of loss of worth. Yes. Right. So from a position of weakness, you may not feel fully empowered yes. to, to reach out, but yeah. Great. Okay. So what do I, what do I really need to succeed and who do you know? Fantastic. Those would be the top two, I think. Yeah. Yes. Fantastic. Well, thank you for sharing that. And so is your focus now? What is your main focus now? And where can we find you? And, you know, all the great things that you're doing. And <laughs> so now I am back at, at a uh, vice president, senior vice president job in the government of Canada or mm-hmm. senior assistant deputy minister. I'm heading up something called the Next Generation HR and Pay, which is a digital transformation really test bed. It's like a research lab. We're researching the possible options for replacing a big digital enterprise system with a SaaS cloud option. So it's a super interesting job. I built a whole team during a pandemic. So I wow, started nice. I started in March, 2020 and hired basically 250 people without ever meeting them. Wow. <laughs> and, and that includes real subject matter experts in compensation and HR and an area that I'm not expert in. So I'm really, really enjoying it. I have the most awesome team. I would just say one of the things that's really interesting that I'm exploring now in leadership, and I do a lot of women in leadership training for people, and I think about it a lot. And then I think about leadership more generally and how we make it inclusive without that, by definition, becoming an exclusion. And so one of the things I've done with this team is I've really hired for attitude. So Hmm. aptitude gets you in the door. So your CV will get you an interview with one of us. But it's really only your enthusiasm and desire to contribute to a big transformation and your excitement about being in this risky space that will actually get you on the roster, right? Right, So hiring for for attitude or character-based hiring, as they call it more Mm -hmm. formally, is really my latest joy. So I've put together this awesome team, which has just awesome levels of diversity, neurodiversity, uh, disability diversity, race and gender and, and sexual preference, like d- diversity, like everything, just everybody is, is part of this team. And the richness of that team is just awe-inspiring. So I'm excited every day. And it sounds like you are. I can yeah. see it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I mean, it's, it's true. Well, it sort of wonderful. bubbles up. Yeah. Yes, that's wonderful. I, I really, really appreciate your sharing with us, your lived experience. Especially Happy around, to. around, especially around this topic of adversity and whether it's in our personal lives or our careers and so many great lessons and just to unpack it, it's, 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 it's been wonderful. And I think that our listeners are really going to gain a lot from it. And I, that's why I do this is, you know, like you said, lived it's experience. Really, why do we share our stories? We share our stories. So in case anybody else has 
similar experiences that they can learn from. So yes, I've watched your interviews. You do great interviews. I really appreciate the opportunity. Thanks oh, for thank including you. me. I feel honored to be included among those you interview. Oh, wow. and, uh, well, yeah, thank you. I, I appreciate, appreciate it. it. Thank you so much, Sharina. All really, the best. Uh, yeah, you take care. Okay. Yeah. Bye. <laughs> Thanks. Bye-bye. I trust you enjoyed this inspiring episode with Shireen Bansby Miller as she shared her lived experience and how we can navigate the adversities in our own lives. Here are her key takeaways. Number one, we are reinventing ourselves all the time. Reinvention is really about growing. It's about taking paths that you didn't even know you could take. Number two, make a list of things that you want changed and divide that list into the things that you actually want to change to fight to change and the ones that you're happy to leave for someone else. Three, reputation is built in steps and it just rides out on horseback. Four, lived experiences, knowing other people have gone, been through similar adversity will help you find common ideas and hope as you go through it. Five, When adversity hits, you have to understand it's disruptive. It's very disorienting. It puts you off balance. But chances are somebody has been through something like this. And if you listen to them, it can allow you to see a possibility that you may maybe hadn't even thought of. Six, uncertainty by definition creates anxiety. By talking about our lived experiences, we can try to get people out of that endless loop of uncertainty. Seven, Unpack the problem. Don't let the label of it be your defining characteristic. Eight, little small successes give you the courage to take that next step. Momentum builds. The bravery of others will inspire you. Nine, figure out what you need and do the unpacking. What do you need to succeed? Who do you know? And 10, Aptitude gets you in the door, but your enthusiasm and excitement will move you ahead. Thank you so much for listening, and thank you again for your support of this podcast as we celebrate two years and International Women's Day. Remember, you are great, you are wonderful, and say it with confidence, my friend. It's my time now. With love and light, till next time, take care.